as, uh, and just pray for me as we go through this process today, and God speaks to us as we proclaim his word and teach his word and preach his word. Uh, let's turn over in our Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, obviously, and uh, let's go over to the seventh chapter. And I believe our text today is going to be 9 through 17, and that is the text that, that we planned. Um, so let's just pick up there. I was kind of debating about, um, uh, actually, even though I, I gave them the, the, the verses and everything, and they did exactly as, uh, as they were supposed to, I was kind of debating about starting with, with verse 1 of chapter 7 today because it all ties together so incredibly beautifully. So, uh, well, actually, let's do that. Let me just, just go back and pick up on verse 1, because this whole chapter is kind of long, but you can't kind of separate the first half from the second half. They don't have the verses, but just listen to this. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel arising, ascending, from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and the sea until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were to be sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And then I looked, and behold... After these things, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And I saw all the angels, all of them, standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. And this is what they said. Saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then the most unusual thing happened to me. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, these who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? And honestly, I had no idea. So I said to him, my Lord, you know. And this is what he said to me. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits in the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. And they will never hunger or thirst anymore. And the sun will not beat down on them or any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to the springs of the water of life. And he himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Lord God, we thank you. And we praise your name. We magnify your name. We thank you for your presence and your spirit. God, we just now pray that you'll take the things, the word of God, apply them to our lives. And Lord, if there is one here today that does not know Jesus Christ, let the day be the day of salvation. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. The reason I went back and started with verse 1 of chapter 7 instead of just starting in verse 9 where our text is today is because you cannot separate what happens in the first few verses from what separate, separate it from what happens in verses 9 through 17. Kind of go back to verse 1 again. He said he saw four angels stand at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of heaven, so no wind would blow on the earth or the sea or any trees. And then he goes on to say this. I'm going to morph it together quickly. There's a lot here. 
All this was to be held back until he sealed the bond servants of his God on their foreheads. And you'll notice this. Um, they sealed 144,000. Uh, 12,000 from every 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but if you spend a lot of time reading the Bible, you'll see that these, these lists appear kind of in different ways at different passages in the Bible. I'm not going to get into that. There's, but anyway, the 12 tribes are there. What you have is this, and why you sometimes kind of, kind of see this put in different ways, is the tribe of Levi is taken out. They become the priestly tribes, so they're not found in some list. And then Dan is not found in some list. Dan is not found in this list, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But of the 12 tribes... There were 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. So, of course, that comes to 144,000. Now, why that is so important is because after you have these, in this time of the tribulation, and that is the first thing that we want to make sure we get right, the setting. Because you have something taking place. The setting is important. Verses 1 through 8, the four angels are holding back the four winds of the what? Of the heaven? No, of the what? What's your Bible say? The four winds of the earth. So what it's talking about there in the first eight verses takes place in heaven or earth. It takes place on earth. That's why it talks about holding back the winds on the earth. Okay, when you get to verse 9, you change to a scene in the throne room of God. Now, is that in heaven? or? And th this is important, so, so let's get this right. Is that in heaven or is that on earth? That is in heaven. It's the throne room of God. So here's what you have. The first eight, and this is why you can't separate that. Are you in heaven now or are you on earth? Well, I sure hope this isn't heaven. <laughs> I sure hope we're on earth right now because if this is as good as it gets, man. Now, we're on earth, obviously. The first eight verses take place on earth. How, how do you transition? How do you get from earth to heaven. And that, that's not just an eschatological question about the future of the book of Revelation. The big question is, you may not know, may not learn anything. There are people who had no concept of what's in the book of Revelation that are going to be in heaven, praise God, because they accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. So, so you do understand this, don't you? Praise God. Us getting to heaven doesn't depend on having perfect knowledge of eschatology, because we would all, none of us would make it that were the case. Okay. So somebody that gets really kind of down the weeds and the theology, you know, let me say this. There's going to be enough theologians in hell to conduct seminary classes. Well, how, how can there be pastors and theologians in hell? Because they knew about God, but they did not know God. And there's a big difference. A five-year-old child who knows very little of the Scripture can come and know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior. That doesn't mean they know a whole lot about the Bible but they know the person that wrote the Bible, and that's important. That's important. Now, having said that, as you understand God's Word as God's child, there is a blessing. Because I want to say this right now. You can go to church, and we get excited and sing songs, and, and all that's good. But when you can go out and you face the problems that you face in the world, unless you know what you believe and know whom you have believed, and you have a foundation to face those things, you're not going to make it. You're going to be kind of blown one way, and, the, and God never intended that. His promises can be believed. But you will never know, you will never know if you can believe his promises until you face tough times. That, that's where really faith is built, okay? Faith is built, not in a worship service where, you know, we're praising God and everybody's happy and everything's going good. That, that's not where faith is built. That's where we, we go and we worship God and we praise God and we edify him and we praise his name, sing songs to him, we learn about him. But you haven't really learned about him until when that tough time comes, you can stand and you can say, no matter what, I trust the promises of God. And that is extremely important. So, these 144,000, they come. They're on earth. The reason when you transition and you get to verse 9, and it says this after these things, after the time of these 144,000 earth, I looked and behold a great multitude from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. 
These got from earth to heaven because these 144,000 were witnesses. You're going to get earth to heaven because somebody told you about Jesus Christ. It may have been somebody in terms of reading the word of God. It could have been a writing of Paul from hundreds of years ago. But somebody gave to you the witness of the person of Jesus Christ, either in the word or directly. And you listen to that, and you believe, and you put your faith and trust. These 144,000 are witnesses. And the reason it's important to understand that the transition from earth to heaven is because during the time of the tribulation, and that's important, another thing about the key here, the time that we're talking about is the time of the tribulation. And let me just say this, what is the tribulation? In Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, uh, Mark 13, all these passages deal with what's called the Olivet Discourse, or Jesus' teaching. The reason called the Olivet Discourse, he's taught on the Mount of Olives. Therefore, it's the Olivet teaching or the Olivet Discourse. But in all these, uh, he, he preaches and teaches about a very bad time that will come upon the earth. And in Matthew, which is the longest of those uh, passages, he says this, that when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. What is the abomination of desolation? What is the holy place? Uh, do you know why over in Israel today there is so much turmoil? There's a lot of reasons for that. That's not a simple question. But, but I, I've been frustrated by this because our political leaders have never really understood this. You go over there and start talking to the Palestinians and the Orthodox Jews, just kind of walking in that area of Jerusalem, spend a few weeks there as I did back in 04, and you talk to them. You'll find out in a hurry. And it was brought to me in this way. There was this little teeny uh, Palestinian guy, a really, really small physically guy. I mean, he was like, you know, maybe like this tall. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, you know, small, some stunted people over there. They haven't had much. And so at any rate, he said, if you give me $100, I will give you a tour of the Temple Mount. Now, I'm taking a class over there, and I don't have a lot of extra money, and he's going to give me a 10-minute tour, and he wants to charge me $100 for the 10-minute tour. And, and, and this guy is kind of sitting there all day, and I said, I'll give you 20 bucks for 10 minutes. I think I got cussed out in Arabic, but I figured, you know, $20 for 10 minutes, if you kind of prorate that, I mean, that's a lot. And besides, he's just sitting there. I thought I was being, you know, nice to him. So anyway, uh, I guess he thought about it, and after a little while, he figured, well, you know, $20 is better than nothing. And, um, uh, you, know, you know, $20 for 10 minutes, I mean, I'd like to have a job making that much. You know, that's, what, $120 an hour? That'd be great, you know what I mean? But at any rate, um, so he, he starts out, and I go, oh, here we go again. He's got broken English. And he's telling me the story of Abraham and Isaac. And here's the Temple Mount right here. And he's telling me this whole, because this happened right here at this point. And he's telling me the point of the story where they go up on the mountain, and then I'm just sitting there going, okay, I've heard this a thousand times. And all of a sudden... The story changed. It wasn't Abraham taking Isaac up to the top of the Temple Mount. It was Abraham taking Ishmael. And I said, wait, they really believe this. We may sit home and wonder why these 40 acres of Temple Mount, why this spot is so important, but they really believe this. They believe that Ishmael is the rightful descendant. And what is on the Temple Mount belongs not to Jesus Christ, but to Allah. And this is the spot where they will tell you that the prophet Muhammad, who was anything but a prophet, took his midnight ride to heaven. And I look over to the side and I see this kid about 10 years old. About that time, the minaret, the towers they have, goes off, and it's a time of prayer. And he throws down this prayer rug and begins to pray. And I'm looking out of the corner of my eye at this 10 or 12-year-old Muslim boy praying with great fervency. And I'm listening to this guy getting more and more worked up about what the Jews have done and how this was the place that Abraham offered not Isaac but bound Ishmael. Now, and either one of them is killed. You'd know the story. But I'm sitting there going at that time, kind of looking in the corner of my eyes. I said, this fight's never going to end. This, this is not, this 10-year-old boy over here, 10, 12 years old, 
These are true believers. They're believing the wrong thing, but they're true believers. You see, what the Bible tells us is this place will be fought over and fought over and fought over. And finally, there will be one that will supposedly bring peace. And he will come. And he will fight. When you see somebody actually get a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinian Arab nations, between the Jewish people and the Islamic people, don't clap your hands. Lift up your head because your redemption draweth nigh. Remember back in Revelation chapter 6. I looked and behold a white horse. And he saw a rider on the white horse. And he had a bow in his hand. And a what was given to him? A crown was given to him. The bow again, and we've talked about this. One thing about our study of the book of Revelation, we're going to kind of go over and over things because you have to just kind of massively review this really to, to, to really understand. And, and I promise you, you come, you're going to get something more every time out of it. But the bow that he has, he holds like this. What is, why is he holding the bow like this? When you see an archer like that, that's the symbol of war. When he's holding a bow like this, you know what that means? I want to talk. Let's make a treaty. It's kind of like, you know, you've got your gun over your head, okay? You can see it. You can see my hand, see my trigger hand, all that. So you can take me out if I try to do something. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to talk. Okay? Well, this one who comes and makes these treaties is the Antichrist. Now, here's what he's going to do. He's going to make a treaty with the nation of Israel. And by de facto, he's going to make a treaty with the whole world. Now, you see what it says? When you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. You know what that means? You've heard of this. We're not gonna get it. We, later on, we're going to spend a lot of time on this. We're not going to spend too much time on it now. But what it is, in a rebuilt temple. You, you can go online, uh, download the Temple Institute. The Jews are desiring to rebuild a temple. Because they believe when they build a temple, the Messiah will come. Well, he's already come. And his name is Jesus. And he came down the Mount of Olives, and he presented himself to the nation of Israel as king. And what did they do to him? They crucified him. But when this false Messiah comes, you know, Satan always tries to, to do something. You know, you've got the Messiah, the false Messiah. You have the true Christ, you have the Antichrist. You go back and forth. You have the false prophet, uh, you have the Holy Spirit. You have Satan, you have God. You, you kind of, everything that God does, Satan tries to mimic. You can kind of see this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But he sets up what's called the abomination of desolation. What that means is this, hey, I've come and I've made a treaty. I am the great political leader. And so what I need from you is to make sure we control this thing and everything that goes right, we're going to have to control all buying, selling, and trading. And to control all buying and selling and trading, you're going to have to take a mark on your right hand or on your forehead, and you're going to have to worship me. And you know what that is. So the world sees, finally we've got a treaty. Things are going to be good. But don't believe it. But you don't believe it. And that is a time frame in which... God seals these 144,000 witnesses. I want to say this. They're going to be witnessing to the person of Christ during the most difficult time in the history of the world. In fact, the Bible says there will never be a time like this, not even since the creation. There's never been a time like this. And they will be witnessing during this 140. Now, they're sealed. What does that mean? They are protected by God. Nothing can happen to them until the days they're witnessing is over. But, and here's the big but, that... Maybe I need to learn to rephrase that. But at any rate, um, if you take the mark of the beast, you'll be okay for a time. You'll be able to buy, sell, trade. But what happens if you don't take the mark of the beast? And these 
that come to know Jesus Christ have not taken the mark of the beast. And here's what the Bible says. These get saved during that time of the tribulation. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude. You think of the slaughter that's going to take place during this time. Those that came to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What happens if you really try to live for the Lord? I mean, if you really take a stand for God. Now, it's easy to just kind of go along with everybody else. But I would say something to the church of the living God. Stand firm on the teaching of God and his word. Don't give up. Don't give in. Stand firm. Because if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says all that desire to live godly, in, do you desire to live godly? And I want to say, there's, I, I see a lot of churches today, and God forgive me if I'm, I'm judgmental. I have to be careful of that. I know that that's perhaps my nature. But I see a lot of churches today that the holiness of God is not really that important. But if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will indeed suffer persecution. Now, there's, 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 I don't feel like we're suffering a whole lot of persecution. Yeah, what we're at in the stage of this is a stage of prejudice. If you stand firm, with Jesus, there's a prejudice. You know, you're kind of going to mock you, make fun of you, you know, laugh at you, whatever. We haven't seen anything yet. Wait until it comes. But... These come out, the Bible says, these come out of a certain period of time. Here's what I want to concentrate on just a moment. Now, the scene is moved from earth to heaven because these are saved during the time of the great tribulation. And the Bible describes them. He said, I saw a great multitude, which nobody, an innumerable number that are saved during this period of time. An innumerable number. You see, there will be people that will be saved. And the Bible describes them in several ways. It says this. First of all, a great multitude. Secondly, which no one could count. I mean, you can't even begin to count them. Thirdly, of every people group, every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. You see, these witnesses, these 144,000 Jewish witnesses, they provide a witness to the person of Jesus. The question is, how is my witness of Jesus? I want you to ask that question right now. I was, was praying last night and um, uh, looking out the window, and you can see lights on in the subdivision. And I was sitting there thinking, as I'm looking at these lights, and again, I don't want to sound judgmental, but you know, God puts thoughts in your mind. You ever look out at people and say, these people are going to hell. I don't mean that, and I don't mean that as a pejorative, I don't mean that as a cuss word. I wish that were the case, I could repent of that and get it over with. But you look at your work and where you are, and I must say this, the thing that bothers me about myself is that sometimes I have a desire to be liked by people and I don't proclaim the truth of God. Don't you think of that right now? And so what seems strange to me is this. People always look at me as being a little bit too hard. But the funny thing about it is, when I stand before God, I don't feel like I'm too hard. I feel like I'm too soft. That I haven't told the truth. If I don't tell people the truth, then God says, their what is on my hands. Their blood is on my hands. Now, if they choose to reject the truth, it no longer becomes my responsibility. <laughs> you, you think salvation is tough. You wait to this tribulation. A great multitude, which nobody, they had died, they had given their lives. They're the souls on the altar. They're those that had died because of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. A great multitude, innumerable, every people group. But here's the interesting thing. They're before the throne of God, and they're before Christ. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute. We're going to come to that in, in just a minute look at it a little more deeply. But they're before the throne of God and Christ, and they have something in their hand. What do they have in their hand? They have white robes on, <laughs> excuse me, and they have in their hands, what, palm branches. Now, I think you've got the white robe. The white robe is a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of salvation. It's a symbol of that these people know Jesus Christ. They've been saved. What do the palm branches represent? When Jesus came down the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday, remember the 
why do they call it Palm Sunday? Okay? They had palm branches. They, they spread them for them. They had palm branches in their hands. Palm branches in the ancient world are a symbol of victory. You know, they've died. They've been killed for their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They're martyred saints. Well, they have palm branches because they have been victorious. I want to say this. You can lose in this world and you can be victorious. You know that? And you can win in this world and you can be the biggest loser there ever was. Because it really doesn't matter. Because they're in heaven now and they're looking down on a world in which the Antichrist has gone mad with power. And they have given their life for this. But praise God, they're before the throne of God day and night, and they're in his temple. And then the Bible says, as one of the elders came, this is an incredible scene, the elders, the 24 elders. They represent the saved down through the ages. This is us. This is the church age. We're in heaven, and we're looking down. And now we're joined by those that come out of this time period. And so, not to give it away, I've, I've kind of given it away, but, but a question is asked. One of the elders came up to John, and he said, these are clothed in the white robes. Who are they and where they come from? And what did he say? These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. These are the ones who have been on earth. See, so John's in heaven. You know, he sees the saved. He sees the church. You realize how good you've got it? If you're saved right now, you're going to go to heaven, praise God. You won't go through these things, amen. Today is the day of salvation, saith the Lord. Today is the day that we need to get saved and come to him, put our faith and trust in him. You say, well, well I'll wait to the future. Uh, do not, because it's going to be bad, number one. And number two, there's a passage in Thessalonians that says, the Lord probably, if you reject him now, talks about him sending strong delusion so they would believe a lie. And I know this, there's a lot of passages here and don't have time to get into these. But let me just say this. God says his spirit will always strive with man. He said, if you do not have the love of the truth, what is the love of the truth? The love of the truth it means that I want to hear the truth. Well, let me just say this. The truth hurts. The truth is very confrontational. The truth makes me see myself as I am. That's why sometimes lies are good to listen to. And we want to listen to them. But the problem is a lie will never set you free. What does the scripture say? You shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. These are here. And the elders come. He said, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've come to know Jesus Christ. This is the scene. This is the picture. This is the incredible picture. And we could look at it different, different times, different stages. But this is the picture. Uh, this is kind of like... When you go behind the scenes, this is the celebration. This is, we're in heaven. And I want you to think of that moment that you come into heaven. The moment you come into heaven. And <clears throat> you see all the saints of God throughout all the ages. And you're there. And you are rejoicing. You're rejoicing. Because you made it. I don't know what to make sometimes a near-death experience, and uh, I'm gonna, our time's running out, but I'm going to say this very quickly. You ever hear these people that die, and they supposedly die, and then they come back to life and stuff? I don't know what to make of that, because some of it seems right, some of it seems wrong. But there was an interesting one <coughs> a number of years ago, and you always hear these people always, they go to heaven, they never go to hell. And I wonder, why, why is it that they always go to heaven when the Bible says the road that leads to hell is broad, and, and the way that leads to heaven is, but they're always... Always, you know, something good is happening. And then one this time, this guy had one. And don't build your theology on this. So I'm going to be reluctant to say this because you say, well, Pastor Tim, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is an interesting little story I'm going to tell you and think about it. So this guy was a coal mine in Kentucky in the 1800s. And the cave fell in and he died. And so, at any rate, uh, they had him on this gurney, and then uh, the coroner came to get him and pronounced him dead. So, at any rate, they got him wrapped up in this sheet. And so, they're carrying him out to the buggy to take him away and dispose of his body, bury him, whatever they were going to do with him. And as they were going out, one of the guys that's holding his body slipped 
they dropped the body. The body fell on the floor. And when the thud of the body hit the floor, there was a groan that came from the body. Ah. I said, okay, we don't need to bury a live guy. And so they got him back up and looked at him. You know, I said, this guy hadn't been breathing for a long time. He's been dead. So anyway, some time passed. And this guy said that what had happened is he had actually died. And he described this beautiful scene. He kind of saw himself hovering over his body, and then he kind of went through the tunnel with the light on the other side, and he came out the other side, and he saw the most beautiful scene. And he was standing looking at the scene, and he could even see from a distance people that he recognized. And there was this thought in his mind, this is going to be great. And then all of a sudden, the ground beneath him opened up, and he was swallowed up. And he immediately found himself not experiencing the eternal bliss of heaven, but he was riding the molten waves of what he said he could only describe as a lake of fire. And then he said, but I got another chance. I did not die. Now, I don't know what to make of that story. But what if one rejects God and right before one goes into eternal damnation, God allows a glimpse of what you will miss. Just think of that. The last sight that you ever had before going to eternal separation from the presence of God, and like I said, I don't know what to make out of this story. But the last sight that you ever had, I'll tell you, I don't know what to make out of that story. And like I said, I'm not going to preach this gospel, but I said this. When I heard that, if I wasn't sure of my salvation, I'd make sure of my salvation. Because hell is too long to get it wrong, and that we know for a fact. That's not an anecdotal story. That's the reality. Well, the Bible says this. And Elijah, if you'll go ahead and put that picture on the screen. Now, I want to give you a picture um, and I want you to look at this picture. It's very appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> you see the little cub and the lioness with the eyes behind the cub and the captions, God and me. These that come out of the Great Tribulation, the Bible describes them in heaven. And here's what the scripture says about them. It describes their nearness to God. I want you to think of that. They've been killed. They've been martyred. And they come out of the great tribulation. And verse 15 says, for this reason they are before the throne of God. And I imagine if you gave your life for God and you got into heaven, you'd want to be right before the throne, wouldn't you, amen? You wouldn't want to leave that sight. And that speaks to the fact of nearness of God. And then it says they shall serve him day and night in his temple. Heaven is not a place of laziness, but praise God, we will serve God. How incredible that is. Serving God, being with him. You know, we're going to talk later on about the second coming of the Lord. That's a day that I, I greatly look forward to because the saints of God that are raptured, you know, the Bible says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who said, I'm called faithful and true. And the armies which are in heaven were following him, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We're going to come back with him. Have you ever kind of watched those scenes, you know, like of, of like when the Super Bowl is going to occur next week? And that scene when they all kind of run out on the field, how great it is, and the celebration. And then a few hours later, <laughs> one of those teams is going to be really sad. But I thought of that. Um, never had that experience, obviously. But taking part in a much greater experience, we will come with the Lord when he comes. I thought of that. I thought in my mind, what will it be like? I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And so they are standing near the throne of God. And they're serving him. 
And the Bible says, he who sits in the throne will spread his tabernacle over. That means fellowship. Let me, let me just say, say something. In a world in which Satan uses perversions of sex to accomplish his goal, people forget why the institution of marriage was even established. You know, in your marriage, you have a picture of your relationship with Christ. And that's what it means, spread his, it speaks of intimacy with God. He'll spread his, ta- it's, it's almost a sense of, in the ancient world, of, of the, the bride and the bridegroom kind of going into the tent their first night together. And that spreading the tabernacle is a picture of the intimacy with God. They're before his throne. And he will spread his tabernacle over them. They'll have fellowship with him. And there's a satisfaction with God. I want to say this. With God, your deepest longing is satisfied. Let me ask you this. Are you looking for something? Do you think there's something missing in your life? You know, the Bible uses the term, we are made complete in him. The neat thing about heaven is... <clears throat> In heaven, you're sitting there thinking, this just can't be any better. Because there's nothing that could be added to me that could make it any better, that sense of satisfaction with God. But you know what? The amazing thing about it is, even though you're saying nothing could be better than this, guess what? The next day, and days are kind of funny in heaven because there's no night there, so it's not like the way we're thinking. Of. But as, as progression goes forth, he shows you something every day. And, and I can say every day when you wake up, but you're not going to wake up because there'll be no sleep there because the curse is gone and you won't get tired. But every day, every progression, God shows you something else. And as you look at that, Lion and the cub, think of this. These have a security with God. Let me ask you this. Is, I'm going to go ahead and call and ask the band to come out at this time, and that picture will fade away, but kind of look at that picture as you're thinking about it. You think of the security with God? Now let me ask you this. How much security do you have in this earth right now? Okay, you've tried some of the things in this world. Where's it gotten you? Better? I mean, you feel good? I mean, you, you listen to live Satan that somehow things are going to get better and better? No. There's a tremendous security with God. And the amazing thing about it is, and think of this. Be careful about how you ever treat another Christian. I never will forget one time I got angry at my wife and said something I shouldn't have. And um, uh, I did confess that to her. And then I, I talked to my dad. This is many years ago. I talked to my father about it later. And he said, well, you might want to be careful, Tim. You just insulted God's daughter. Okay, that, that one kind of hurt, Okay. Okay, I go with a lot of things, but you know, okay. You think of the security that God gives us? He's going to take care of us. He's going to watch over us. And we have that security with him. And he will guide them to the springs of water of life. He's going to guide you. What an incredible scene. Yeah, yeah, we can get kind of confused about all the things in the book of Revelation, eschatology. Stop that for just a moment. He will guide us to the springs of the water of life. You know what that means? God is going to show you, and you don't even know this. Let me ask you, do you, you think you know what will, I think I know what will make me happy. Okay? Okay. I think I know what will make, you think you, you don't know what will make you happy. You don't know what will fill your deepest longing. I don't say that insulting, but I've been through this a million times. I, have you ever thought, okay, if I get this, this is going to be really happy, this is going to be really good, and the problem happens when you get it, 
Does it satisfy that deepest longing? No, it doesn't. It doesn't satisfy that deepest longing. But he said, I will guide you to the spring of the water of life. And as Spence and you guys play some background music, just think of that. He's going to guide us to the springs of the water of life. You don't even know. I, ha- I don't really know what that is. But I know it's going to be better than anything. I've- now I have some ideas, but we won't get into that. But it's going to be a deeper, deeper satisfaction in every day, every way. And then when we come to springs of the water of life, as we come to the time of the invitation, we close the service, we will experience the joy of God. Wow. It just can't get any better. It just cannot get any better than this. Yet, God, you make every day better. Wow. I can't wait for what tomorrow holds. I'll contrast that with that guy in that cave in in Kentucky he saw it from a distance but he never experienced it at least in that scene just think if I could empty out hell right now and I could say okay we're going to have a church service and you guys just listen to the service and if you feel led at the end of the the, after I get finished preaching for a while and stuff um, uh, and then if you you would like to you can come forward and accept Jesus Christ as Savior um, then you can do that no, we wouldn't even start preaching. They'd be coming down because they had seen what it is to live in a life without God. Think of that. Let's stand as we come to the altar. You can know life without God or you can know life with God. The choice is yours. God is leading, won't you respond, won't you let him have his way?